it's really awesome to see so many of you here in person in halifax in nova scotia it's my first time here also want to do a little bit of shout out to the clouderans who are here uh, they are also here a little bit to send me moral support because they know it's my first keynote so thank you In November 2022, ChatGPT was released, and it opened the eyes of the world to the potential of artificial intelligence. I am incredibly grateful. It's been exhilarating to say the least. But if ChatGPT was the only way we could access artificial intelligence, then I wouldn't be here, and we wouldn't be talking about AI in an open source conference. So why am I here? Allow me to introduce myself to you. I'm Charu. I'm going to share the story of my life with you. Don't worry, it's not going to be long. I grew up in middle class India in a loving family where both my parents worked in public sector jobs. I saw firsthand the impact of their good work on society. And for as long as I can remember, I wanted to do the same. But this was India, you didn't choose what you wanted, you chose a job that would pay well. so you either became a doctor or an engineer my sister became a doctor i became an engineer and as was common for a lot of engineers in india at that time i came to the us to do my masters i graduated from stanford i joined a startup that got bought by hp i liked engineering enough but i wanted to do more so i figured i'd change my career path i went back to school i did a degree specially focused on public policy and public administration from Harvard Kennedy School but i couldn't take it further so i came back to engineering i joined another startup that got acquired by cloudera and cloudera is where i was as part of the machine learning team when chat gpt was released article after article came out about how it's the first app to cross 100 million users in 2 months but the thing that really caught my eye was stories like this villages in india had access to education schemes being told to them from a chatbot on their phone powered by open ai and it was speaking to them in their local language what are the problems with education in in poorer places in india not enough access to teachers not enough access to textbooks not in their language but suddenly smartphones are everywhere and now all of these people could use a smartphone could have the potential of having a personal tutor explaining anything to them in their local language so this is the potential of ai that excites me the most this is why i am here as part of the cloudera machine learning team i get to work daily with customers who are also on their ai journey trying to figure out how to incorporate ai into their products and their services some of them are working on bringing financial services to lower income populations some of them are working on medical trials finally i'm working in a space which has the potential to do social good and it's taking all the energy that i have to stop myself from jumping up and down the stage saying i can't believe i get to work on this so the learnings and patterns that i have seen in the last 6 months working with these customers the pattern that i have seen specially of how open source is democratizing ai this is what i'd like to talk to you about let's start with an example we are all developers here how many of you have heard of github copilot or have played with it or used it plenty plenty sure it's uh, it's fairly popular and it was the same requirement that one of the organizations that i was working with a couple of months ago had they also wanted a code generation tool to be able to make their developers more productive but they had fairly strict security regulations they didn't want any of their code snippets code samples coding prompts to go out externally to a service like github copilot so when the open source model star coder was released it was really easy for them to download it deploy it on their open source on premise cluster and now suddenly their developers had code generation 
Their first version was pretty rudimentary, but the second one, they could add a little bit of code examples to their prompts. And then through this prompt engineering, they could have the LLM respond with suggestions that actually match the coding style of their organization. And then what made it really powerful was that they could fine tune this model with the coding data set that they had. They had their own coding libraries, they fine tuned the model, and now the model was responding with functions that were proprietary to their coding libraries. Then they were able to scale it up using another open source tool called Ray, and they went from zero to 200 developers in just about four days. So they got the productivity gain that they were looking for, it was cheaper than GitHub for them, and it met their security requirements. This is a pattern that we've seen not just in this example, but in a lot of examples in a lot of organizations. This pattern of being able to use open source models, being able to extract more value from them by using domain-specific data, having this open ecosystem that surrounds these models and data sets, and then having open source expand and diversify this community that's involved in AI now has, has been really enlightening to me, and this is what I'd like to talk about. So let's talk about the open models first. In the last six months, a large number of large language models have been released. Starcoder is the one that I just spoke about in the code generation example, but by far the most popular one has been Llama. Llama was released by Meta in February 2023. Since then, it's been downloaded a whopping 30 million times. This next bit is a quote from Meta's conference of last week. They said, the open source community has really embraced the Llama series of models and fine-tuned and released 7,000 derivatives of the Llama model. On average, across standard benchmarks, it has improved the performance by 10%. If that's not a ringing endorsement of open source, I, I don't know what is. So let's double click into these 7,000 fine-tuned derivatives. What, what are those? So earlier, before fine-tuning, the assumption was that the larger the model, the better the performance. Larger models obviously need more compute and more memory, so they are more expensive. The largest model, GPT-4, was performing better than any other model at every task. After fine-tuning, though, the same small models could rival the performance of the largest model. So now suddenly cutting edge performance was available at a much cheaper rate because the smaller models obviously needed less compute and memory. But the innovation didn't stop there. The accessibility of these models didn't stop there. Even if you had the smallest model, but if you wanted to fine tune it on multiple tasks, you'd still have multiple models requiring that much more storage and compute. But open source libraries started implementing techniques like parameter efficient fine tuning and quantization and LoRa and all of that helped freezing most of the model and then modifying just a few of the model's parameters. Again, reducing the storage and compute requirements of these models, again, making these models cheaper to use and more accessible. So the point is it's not just the open source models that were being made available to all, it's the fact that these fine tuning techniques that enabled us to extract more value from these models were also being made available to all. We spoke about models and we spoke about fine tuning. Let's talk about the actual data that's needed to fine tune these models. The data that's needed to train foundation models is very large, it's internet scale. Very few organizations have the capability to scrape all of this data, sort through it, and then fi fine tune, uh, then train the foundation model. But the data that's needed for fine tuning, that's much smaller scale, uh, orders of magnitude smaller. And why is that? Because the fine tuning is very specific to a task. The code generation example that we just spoke about, the organization had very good samples of their code from their coding libraries and used that to fine tune the LLM. There are caveats. This data set has to be really well curated. The examples have to really be solid in terms of the task that is being expected from the LLM. 
here's another place where data helps making the LLM be more contextually accurate. We've all heard about LLMs hallucinating, but with additional context data, you can guide the foundation model to give you more factually correct responses and more contextually correct responses. This technique is called retrieval augmented generation or RAG, and it's becoming quite critical in almost all AI solutions that we see now. Here's a screenshot of a demo we did a couple of months ago. If you ask the LLM a simple question like, what is iceberg? The answer that you get is on the top right of your screen. It's a fairly generic answer. Iceberg is a large piece of ice. It's what the model was trained on. It's what it spits out. But now, if we ask the same model, the same question, but give it additional data and context, and in this example, the data that we give it, gave it was Cloudera's documentation on Apache Iceberg, now the response that you get is a more contextually accurate answer. Iceberg is a high-performance stable format. The takeaway is that your data is valuable no matter the scale, and it's this data that will allow you to enable your AI to be more valuable to you. Now I want to talk about the ecosystem that's surrounding these models and data sets. Again, in the last few months, a lot of ML tools have sprung up in the, in the landscape. Let's talk about a few of those. Hugging Face has become the de facto location of where a lot of models are being open sourced. Already about more than 300,000 models have been released and 65,000 data sets have been released. Just as important though is Hugging Face's Transformers library. Almost any example that you see in the internet now trying to teach you how to interact with LLMs will be using this library. It makes it much easier to figure out how to interact with an LLM regardless of the architecture the model has. Vector databases are fairly popular. Milvus and Chroma are just a couple of the open source ones. They are also becoming really critical for the RAG architecture that we just spoke about. Vector databases enable semantic search, and it's the results of this semantic search that you give to the LLM as part of the query uh, in the RAG pattern. And Langchain is a popular tool which connects all of these various things. So the models, the data sets, the prompts, the vector databases, and it streamlines that flow. 5.1 monthly downloads. And then when you're ready to scale up your solution, open source projects like Re and KServe help with that. The code generation example that we saw, the organization used Re to scale up from zero to 200 in about four days and 200 to 2000 in about a week. Ray was also used by OpenAI to train GPT-4. And this is the pattern that brings us trusted AI. By the way, this is just a landscape that I'm trying to show you. This is not a recommendation for which tool to use to build your generative AI. There is a talk for that, uh, I think, tomorrow, how to use the Apache ecosystem to build generative AI. So I would highly recommend that for it. But here, I'm just trying to tell you that this landscape of open source tools brings us all the benefits that all of you in the room have, have seen before. All the open source benefits are also available here. You have transparency of how the models was built, what data was used to train them. Users have a choice of which models they want to use, where do they want to host the models, whether it's on-prem or in the public cloud, and this all of this avoids vendor lock-in. Because the entire software stack surrounding this is open, any user can build industry strength, trusted AI. Next, I want to highlight how all of the innovation that's happening across the models, the data, the ecosystem, then allows us to expand this AI community. Earlier, the realm of machine learning and artificial intelligence was limited to a few set of people, a few set of experts, the data scientists. They would be the ones who would curate the data, train the model, build an AI application on top of it. But now, users have a much better starting point. They can start from a pre-trained model. And the open ecosystem and the innovation that's happening around it makes it that much easier to extract value out of it. 
So now we've suddenly expanded the bucket of AI practitioners to also include a lot of developers. There is a third group of people that are now also becoming part of the community. And those are the domain experts. Let's take the example of the legal domain. Here's a metric for you. 86% of low-income individuals in the US do not get the legal services they need. Would it be nice if we had an LLM that could solve this? But the challenges here are much greater. Even just creating the data set, it needs deep legal expertise and highly paid lawyers to be able to come together and do that. Was this matter subjudice or not? Um, does the statute of limitations apply? What is the statute of limitations? Um, and then not just building the data set for training the LLM, then you also need a data set for benchmarking the LLM to figure out if the LLM is being able to do the legal, legal reasoning task that we require it to do. There are a few efforts going on. Uh, a bunch of these are sponsored by Stanford University's Center of Research on Foundation Models. There is a pile of law data set, which is specifically focused on improving access to justice initiatives. There's a benchmark that's being made. It's called Legal Bench, and that's also specifically trying to collaborate across computer science and legal communities. But there's a lot more work to be done. Domain experts are now part of this AI practitioner bucket. Open source has expanded the AI community, not just in numbers, but also in the diverse backgrounds these people bring to the table. But why is any of this important? Why is it important that AI be democratized? And my statement to you is this. Without the diversity that we see in the people that are part of the community, the developers, the data scientists, the domain experts. Without the open source models that are now available, without the fine tuning techniques, without the benchmarks and the data sets, it is not possible to build any real world generative AI solution. Any AI product right now is already taking advantage of all the open source innovation that is happening across all of these four pillars. I will leave you with one final thought. Although we've seen an explosion of innovation happening across all of these pillars, there's one pillar that's not seen that much, and that's the domain-specific data pillar. The legal example that I just spoke about. Building the training data set is only the first step towards being able to solve a social issue like access to legal justice. And no single entity can do this on their own. And that is what, me, what made me remember the mission of the Apache Software Foundation. It's software for public good. And I wondered if it could be not just software, but also data for the public good. Could we, as members of the ASF capitalize on the diverse outreach that we have and enable lots of first steps like this that can then help with solving these social issues. We are here to celebrate and emphasize the contributions of the community in open source software. Could we then come together and emphasize the contributions of the community over data, over data sets, and then have these steps being taken to finally be able to get to a place where we can have AI for social good. That is my hope. It's been an honor presenting my thoughts with all of you. I look forward to all the upcoming talks. It's gonna be a great conference. Thank you very much.